Um, uh, lunch uh, will be again at the Athenaeum. Uh, it, there is a charge for the meal if you want to uh, join us for that. And then the rest of the afternoon's programs will take place at the uh, Athenaeum, uh, the signing of the declaration and, uh, and those things. Um, the, the dinner cruise that's listed on the, um, the agenda is actually um, uh, should not have been listed on the agenda. It's, it's just for speakers and participants. It's not open uh, to the general public. So that um, our, our, our uh, programming for the public uh, ends with the, uh, with the signing of the uh, declaration. But we hope you all can join us this afternoon down at the, uh, down at the hotel. And uh, if you can make lunch, that's terrific. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our, our next speaker. Uh, Judge Marilyn Kamen, uh, who will um, be talking uh, this morning and uh, giving reflections on women in international criminal law, and uh, no one better to do so. Uh, Judge Kamen received her law degree from the University of Wisconsin, her graduate degree from the University of Chicago, and her Bachelor of Arts degree from Vanderbilt University. Since 1990, she has been a judge with the Hennepin County District Court, and in November of 2002, Judge Kamen was one of the first four American jurists and the first American woman jurist to be selected by the United Nations to serve as an international judge abroad for that organization. Judge Kamen's mission was in Kosovo and involved hearing of cases of war crimes, organized crime, ethnically motivated disputes, and trafficking of human beings. She is a member of the American Bar Association serves as chair of the United Nations International Institutions Committee and the publications officer for the ABA section of international law. Join me in welcoming Judge Marilyn Kamen. Uh, you took my script. You need to bring it, give it back. <laughs> Thank you. Now I can go ahead. <laughs> Okay, uh, it's my distinct pleasure to be here today and to address you and to see so many women in the audience whose names I have recognized and whose faces I have met during this conference. I easily could be speaking about each of you. I first want to, of course, acknowledge the generosity and arrangements of the Robert Jackson Center the Chautauqua Institution, and of course, our good friend, David Crane, for making this uh, event possible. I have been asked to speak on the topic of reflections on women in international criminal law. And to do so, I am going to take from my experiences as an international judge for the United Nations mission in Kosovo. And I'm also going to weave into my comments uh, the names and short vignettes of the lives of four women, two of whose names you will undoubtedly recognize and two whose names you will not recognize. But all of these women will become familiar to you, hopefully through my remarks, for the role they have played in the pursuit of international justice for women. Uh, during my brief comments today, I would like to give you some historical background on Kosovo because I have learned in my speaking to groups that it is a question mark in people's minds. As you may have already concluded, it's not a name that has been mentioned often in the comments or the courts uh, discussed yesterday and today. We hear about Yugoslavia, Rwanda, Sierra Leone, Cambodia, and of course the International Criminal Court. But Kosovo does have a role to play in that evolution of international criminal law. So where is Kosovo? Um, it is across the boot from Italy near the Adriatic Sea and it is highlighted with the circle that is shown on the slide in front of you. I need to emphasize that Kosovo is not a country. That's a fact that escapes many people. Kosovo is a province of today's Serbia <clears throat> and has been a province of Serbia since Serbia was formed in 1912. 
As you can see by this map in front of you, Kosovo is bounded obviously by Serbia, but also the countries of Montenegro, Albania, and the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. I'll return to this slide momentarily, but I wanted to give you, geographically speaking, some idea of where Kosovo is. It is triangular in shape, and the capital, Pristina, is to the right on this slide, indicated by the red dotted line. A few basic facts to the conflict in Kosovo, which um, you may have forgotten since the late 1990s. Um, it all, the, the conflict really, if you had to name a date, the date that you would name is 1389, over 600 years ago. And at that location, at a field outside of present-day Pristina, Kosovo, the Ottoman Empire came with their armies and they engaged the local people of Serbian, today's Serbian ethnicity, in battle at a field called Kosovo Polja, if you're speaking Serbian, or Fush Kosova, if you're speaking Albanian. Because of course, in this area of the world where all matters still remain unsettled, it is important to say both languages. So in 1389, there was a battle at Kosovo Polja, Fush Kosova, and the Ottoman Empire prevailed. That is a fact that was never lost and has never been lost in the minds and the memory of the Serbian people. And so, as you are well aware, in 1980, Joseph Tito died, and his iron hand keeping the republics of Yugoslavia together was gone. And that meant that the republics of Yugoslavia started to spin off, as it were, into space, like meteorites. And Croatia, Slovenia, we've got Bosnia, Herzegovina, the conflict there. And Slobodan Milosevic, being a very shrewd politician, remembered and understood the significance to the Serbian people of their defeat at Kosovo Polja, Fush Kosova, 600 years earlier. He returned to that exact location insofar as historians can pinpoint it, and he declared and rallied the Serbian people, we will never abandon Kosovo. And as you know, the history after that point in time was that the Serbian government and army under his leadership began a campaign of expulsion, terror, and um, humiliation for the Kosovo Albanian population uh, who were living in Kosovo. Well, I'll, I'll show you that here. Okay. And so, um, so what happened after Slobodan Milosevic said, we will never abandon Kosovo, um, the 90s were um, a decade of conflict. Kosovo Albanian judges were dismissed from their posts. Kosovo Albanian public education ended and that had to go underground. Kosovo Serbian police took over from Kosovo Albanian police. And in 1997, the Kosovo um, Albanian population uh, became dissatisfied with that and the Kosovo Liberation Army, a resistance group by the Albanian population in Kosovo, made its first appearance and that's when the conflict really became public and um, military, if you will. And so there were, um, you know, skirmishes between the Kosovo Serbian police and the Kosovo Liberation Army and it really became quite dreadful, if you will. All of this came to the attention of Secretary of State, then Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, and uh, she persuaded uh, that in March, on March 23, 1999, NATO would intervene in an effort with a bombing campaign in Serbia and Kosovo in an effort to try to get Slobodan Milosevic to end his campaign of terror in Kosovo. And so this photo is a photo that I took in 2003 when I was in Belgrade for a war crimes testimony. 
And, but it is the Serbian government building that was bombed in 1999 by NATO, and it remains, if you will, a monument to that bombing campaign. The Serbian people and government have made the decision not to refurbish the building. And so in 1999, uh, NATO intervened with the bombing campaign in Serbia and a bombing campaign in Kosovo. And this photo is one of a house on the way to my eventual city in Kosovo that ha clearly had been bombed. Uh, the bombing campaign lasted for about 83 days. In June of 1999, the United Nations Security Council enact enacted Resolution 1244. That resolution declared that the United Nations would become the civilian interim administration for Kosovo. Okay, what does that mean? Basically, it means that the UN was going to run Kosovo. And what does that mean? Roads, government, judiciary, judges. And so while you've heard about the ad hoc courts of Yugoslavia and Rwanda, and the court at Sierra Leone was formed under a special treaty, the judges, like me, who eventually came into Kosovo, uh, did so, and we are, were what is called an internationalized judicial system of Kosovo. We went into their judicial system, applied their law, um, which I'll talk more about in a moment. And so we were, were called the internationalized courts of Kosovo. At the time, I think it was um, another experiment if, you, experiment, if you will, in international judicial uh, post-conflict approach to resolving um, societies torn apart and the rule of law destroyed. The symbols of the conflict between the Ottoman Empire, of course, would be the mosque, because Kosovo Albanian people are Muslim. And the other symbol is the Christian church, because the Serbian people are Eastern Orthodox. And it is those two symbols that, that really embody the conflict, which is both religious, cultural, and historical. So in 1999, the United Nations decided to go into Kosovo, and uh, sitting back in Minnesota, I can say I read the newspapers thoroughly. I, uh, you know, I took notice of this. I was very concerned, and then uh, three years later, I find myself boarding a plane to become an international judge for Co in Kosovo. I'm asked often, how, how did you, a state court trial judge, general jurisdiction, become selected for this position? Um, while well, I applied, was interviewed, and was selected, I suppose that's the short answer, but the real answer is that um, I had the credentials that, you know, were needed for the job and was ultimately chosen. I had been a criminal defense attorney, so I understood criminal law and criminal procedure. Unfortunately, I'd represented my share of murderers, rapists, and drug dealers, and I had been a trial court judge for 15 years. And the state of Minnesota has a leave of absence policy where we can take unpaid leave of absences for up to one year to do whatever we want. And so when the uh, billing came across the email screens, if you will, you know, the UN is looking for judges to go to Kosovo, I thought, well, you know, what the heck, I'll, try, I'll apply for this job. And I didn't know that I would get it, but um, so th that's how that situation went. In terms of international judges going into Kosovo, in 1999 the UN decided to go into Kosovo. It was not until the year 2000 that they decided to bring international judges into Kosovo, and the reason they did that was because they were really optimistic. The UN was really optimistic at the beginning, and they were hoping that they could, you know, fix the local judicial system by just retraining local judges, the Kosovo Albanian judges and the Serbian judges and the Kosovo Bosnian judges, and everything was going to work out okay. Well, it was a dreadful. It was just dreadful. The verdicts were dreadful. The, ber the proof was dreadful. And so the United Nations decided in the year 2000, December 2000, to invite international judges into Kosovo. Well, they didn't invite Americans. Now, that's a whole other political thing that I'm only dimly aware of. But 
in 2002, they decided they were going to give some Americans a try. Now, you all know that America is a common law jurisdiction. Kosovo is a civil law system. And so clearly, you know, one of the interview questions, uh, Judge Kamen, you know, what do you know about civil law? I said, well, not much. But, uh, you know, I'm a quick learner and a hard worker, and I think that has proved itself. So I became a judge for the United Nations mission in Kosovo in November of 2002. And again, uh, you know, the capital of Kosovo is Pristina in the dotted circle to the right. I was posted eventually to a city to the west of the province, a city called Pechpea, depending upon the language that you use. About 65 miles in distance, about two and a half hours by car ride, if you will. And so I arrived in Pristina in November of 2002. Uh, I was issued my UN vehicle, and there you see my passport, just strapped around my waist, and I was told, you know, essentially, find your way to Pechpea. It's like there's no hand-holding when you're in mission, that's for sure. And so I drove up the road, following the road signs. Now, you know, there's nothing like an interstate 35 or 80 or 394 on the road in multicolored luminary signs. There just isn't. They said, well, follow the dog road until you see the snake road, and then don't turn left at the snake road, but stay on the dog road. And so I stayed on the dog road until I came to the horse road. And the reason for that, it sounds quaint, but when you're in international mission, not everybody uses the same word for dog. And I, you know, I know that it's, I think in Russian it's sabaka, it's chien in French, and it's dog in English. But I don't know the Albanian word for dog, and I don't know the Serbian word for dog. And so I couldn't, you know, we couldn't talk to one another. And a lot of the people in mission, even though English was the mandated common language of mission, they couldn't say the same words. And so the whole province was mapped out using animal signs for highways. And actually, it, you know, it worked. So I drove my car from Pristina to my new city, a stunningly beautiful city at the base of the Albanian Alps. And as I approached Pechpea, this is what I saw, and these are the buildings that eventually would become my home while I was in Kosovo. Uh, in the springtime, I, I did arrive there in November, but in the springtime I learned to, to jog the valleys of the mountains, uh, obviously in an effort to relieve some of the stress that really I, I learned to live with as, as I lived in mission and uh, as you'll learn under 24-hour guard. So what is in a name anyway? What do you say? Where do you say you live and how do you say it? It is significant and it is significant when said by an international judge. On this sign, it says Mira Savini, which is Albanian. And the first word is Pea. That's Albanian. The second word is Pech. That's Serbian. But as I unfortunately figured out and learned firsthand, is if you're in a different area, you darn well better say Pech Pea and not Pea Pech. Because the significant, the order in which you say the names of the city, supposedly indicates your judicial bias. And so um, I may say pay up hatch, I may say patch pay up. I, it's not, I don't intend anything by it, folks. It's just, I will say both names. And uh, if you were to go to Kosovo today, you would see that all Serbian uh, alphabets all words in the Serbian alpha alphabet have been obliterated. This happens to say the Commercial Bank of Belgrade. I do speak a little Russian in my past, and so, but, but, but that's a problem. After the UN came to um, Kosovo in 1999, um, someone spoke Russian, and they were killed for it in Pristina. So as I drove up the highway, I saw that even the barbed wire attempts at protect the, protecting the Serbian shrines was not going to be successful. And the churches there have been destroyed. I also saw the stick, the, the, the plastic bag on the stick, and naively coming from Minnesota, I didn't realize that that meant 
the presence of a landmine. And of course, as a UN employee, we all underwent landmine training to make sure that we only walked where we were supposed to walk. And the suitcase in the field, to me, speaks volumes and tells a particularly sad tale because this suitcase I came across um, um, near a Serbian, dis uh, deserted Serbian village. So clearly someone in flight had dropped their belongings to run for safety. It could have been an Albanian person running for safety as well. But to me, it tells volumes. So the first person I want to mention today is not is a woman that I rec fully recognize did not have anything to do technically with international criminal law. But I, I was sitting back at my desk and I said, well, where did this all begin, really? Where did it all begin? And it began with Eleanor Roosevelt. It began with Eleanor Roosevelt because she was instrumental in working on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And um, after, after her efforts, um, you know, we, we saw the, the decades since then, since the enactment of that document, um, result in codification, the Genocide Convention in 1948 and, and other conventions, and then the development of international criminal law. And so I thought it important to start with Eleanor Roosevelt, a woman, you know, who needs no introduction to you, but who needs our gratitude, to express our gratitude for what she did and so for how, how hard she worked. What kinds of cases did I do in Kosovo? This was the billing, if you will, on the advertisement, the job advertisement that I responded to. War crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, organized crime, da 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 da. I did all of those. I acted as an investigating judge, kind of like a prosecutor. That's what the code was. That was civil law then. Um, but in fact, I did a lot more. I did more, if you will, local law than I did international law. I had one war crimes case. I had a murder trial. I had an uh, unauthorized explosion of a device trial. And then I had tons and tons of investigations. And so uh, the legal framework that I found when I went to Kosovo was I had to kind of figure it out on the plane, if you will. The, the, e, the UN sent me this big PDF and said, well, read it and get used to it, Judge. And, and so I landed, and this is what I was trying to figure out. So there's the criminal code for the former Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. There's the criminal procedural code. There's the criminal code of Kosovo. I don't have time to tell you about how independent Kosovo was, but it basically was an autonomous uh, province of Serbia and had a lot of its own laws. And so th that was in play. The criminal code of the Serbian Republic was in play. UNMIC, United Nations Missions in Kosovo regulations were in play. International laws and treaties were in play. And so we had to try to figure out which law applied, how to apply it correctly, and which of these documents, if any, took precedence over the other. This uh, slide bears a little bit of um, explanation and I think worth pausing because it is a photo from my, my actual war crimes trial and I think it indicates uh, the presence of women in international criminal law. As you will see here, this is uh, Kamadoni Niasulu, who is a prosecutor from Malawi with his bodyguard. This woman whose face you can barely see is a Canadian uh, court reporter. And that court reporting in Kosovo consisted of typing fast on a computer before the electricity went out and your computer went dead. No, oh, I'm serious. And then this is the Albanian interpreter, the Serbian interpreter, the Kosovo Bosnian judge, the international judge for Mauritius, and me. And so Kamadoni Niasulu, the international prosecutor from Malawi, was handling such sensitive cases that he actually lived on the um, British air base down in Pristina and was driven daily uh, 65 miles from Pristina to Pechpea for his trial and then driven back at night. But he was at very high risk target. This is a co picture of my Kosovo uh, war crimes defendant and the picture also bears a moment of remembrance and observation for the fact that here, if you can tell, this is the judge's bench. This is where Kamadoni Niasulu is sitting with his bodyguards. These are Pakistani guards for the entire courtroom. Defense counsel is sitting here and the defendant, Serbian defendant, is sitting here. Here is a chair in front of the Serbian defendant for the witnesses to testify. Now think about that. 
The person that committed the crime, allegedly, is sitting in back of you, and you have your back to them as a witness. The courtroom layout was prescribed, and we did not move it, and that is how the witnesses had to come in and testify. The next woman I want to mention is a, a woman whose name is Hajeri Shahidi. Now, this is not a picture of Hajeri Shahidi. I don't have a picture of her because she was dead before I came to mission. But perhaps you can keep one of these women in your mind as I read my comments about Hajeri Shahidi. She was married on a Sunday, murdered on a Monday, and buried in the woods in the same afternoon. Married life lasted less than 12 hours for her. It ended with the 20-year-old Kosovar Albanian woman laying dead on her family's living room carpet with seven bullets fired into her torso. The killer, the police later found out, was her brother Ismet. The murder was witnessed by her mother and brother. Her crime was supposedly not being a virgin on her wedding night, thus bringing her family into disrepute. Under traditional Albanian cultural code, known as the Code of Lake Dukagini, a bride may be returned to her family if she is not as she should be on her wedding night, or the groom may kill her himself with a bullet traditionally given to the groom by the bride's family. The problem? Upon exhumation of Hajeri's body, it was found that she indeed was a virgin. The international police with whom I worked also uh, had difficulty and they tried to find the killer. The next problem, no one would talk about it because to talk about it is to violate the code of Lake Dukagini by pointing the finger at someone else and the code says this was a permissible killing. This was an honor killing and therefore it was a legitimate killing. And so when I went to Kosovo, the cultural norms that uh, impinged on what I thought was uh, carrying out the rule of law was something that we had to deal with. In January of 2003, my life took an unexpected turn when um, a rocket-propelled grenade went into the headquarters of the police and judicial building in Bea Pech. Later, the State Department indicated to me that the reason for this incident, and you can see where some of the damage was, was that local elements of the population were unhappy with the verdicts that I was rendering and that my friend, colleague from Uganda was rendering. And so after that, I had bodyguards wherever I went and I could not go to the grocery store, to the beauty shop, or to work, obviously. I could no longer work and run the mountains unless I had the bodyguards with me. And so these are some of the women bodyguards that uh, also guarded me. The woman to the left was uh, from Portugal and she had actually done close protection work for the Prime Minister, President of Portugal. And Veronica on the right is uh, from Chicago. And so they guarded me well, along with the many gentlemen who kept me safe while I was abroad. So that brings me to the life of Sabahate Tolai. She was 35, turning 36 in November 2003, a few months after I returned from mission. She was not married and she had no children. She was born and lived in the village of Poberge in the municipality of Dechani, which is south of Pechpea. During the 1999 war in Kosovo, she was a member of the Kosovo Liberation Army. By 2003, under UNMIC, she had been a police officer for roughly two and a half years. First, she had worked as a Kosovo police officer in the Dechani patrol unit, and later she was transferred to Peapech to work in the murder squad of the investigation unit. That is how we met. She was doing investigations and I was doing international judge work. She was inter inter investigating high profile murders in the region, region and referred those investigations to international judges like me. Sabahate and I had numerous conversations and we felt a particular kinship with one another. 
One day I asked her about her safety because I had bodyguards and she did not. Sabahati just shrugged and said, well, this is what I do. I enjoy it and it is the right thing to do, so I do not worry. On November 24, 2003, at 7.45 in the morning, Sabahate and two other Kosovo police officers were going to work when they were attacked in a drive-by assassination plot. Sabahate and another police officer were killed. The third officer survived his wounds. Eventually, a gentleman named Bedri, Bedri Krasnici was sentenced to 27 years for double murder. The other accused were acquitted because of lack of evidence to prove the charges against them. Really? Was there a lack of evidence or was this another case where people did not want to talk? Well, in December of 2008, only nine months ago, there's a sad postscript to Sabahate's case. The wire services in Kosovo carried the following story. A man convicted for the murder of two Kosovo police service members in 2003 escaped from the Dubrava prison. It has been confirmed. A statement in Pristina identified him as Bedri Krasnici and added that nine members of the correctional services were held on suspicion that they helped him escape. Krasnici was reported missing, but police say that he likely escaped in the night between Saturday and Sunday, which makes the investigation more difficult. Search is underway for the inmate who was last year found guilty and sentenced to 27 years behind bars for murdering two and wounding a third. As of this date, the murderer has not been found. Well, um, I'm going to uh, just take a few more moments and, and uh, give you a, a few light examples of mission life and then conclude with the example of the fourth woman. Um, it would be just a moment, and thank you for listening today. You know, when you're in mission life and working under such conditions, you just have to have some fun, right? So I had my sister send me, you know, you've heard of the Jif and Skippy Wars? Okay, so this was Jif and Skippy. And my sister sent me in February of 2003 a jar of Skippy by sea and a jar, a jar of Jif by air. And so we had to see which jar of peanut butter came first, and of course it was the Jif. No offense to you Skippy fans out there, but <laughs> so uh, we couldn't get peanut butter abroad. After a while, I wanted some peanut butter. And then I wanted to tell you, Bill Clinton, he must now be heavenly, okay? And this is why I say this. When you go to Pristina, if you're having a crisis of confidence as an American, go to Kosovo. They love Americans because they think that Madeleine Albright and Bill Clinton save their lives to the NATO bombing campaign. And so you will go, you'll see a boulevard in Pristina that was, I think, called Pristina Boulevard or some, you know, routine name. And it's now Bill Clinton Boulevard and it intersects Mother Teresa Boulevard. <laughs> <laughs> so we know that Bill Clinton has, is residing with the saints. What can we say? The last woman I want to honor, and, and very, very briefly, because I know my time is short, is a woman by the name of Natasha Kondich. I, I returned from mission in the summer of 2003, and I happened to join the American Bar Association, and I met Natasha because she was getting the ABA Seeley Award, Rule of Law Award, at that point in time. And she has founded a, a non-governmental organization in Belgrade called the Humanitarian Loss Center. Since 1990, she has pursued the facts surrounding civil and criminal human rights abuses against repressed minorities throughout the former Yugoslavia. Um, as a result, she has been subject to uh, threats, harassment, and harsh physical assault. When we met one another in San Francisco, she was limping. And I, I, just, I just couldn't ask her, you know, did someone do this to you? How did you become, how did you have this limp? At any rate, when the 1999 bombing began, campaign began in Kosovo, she jumped into her car and drove 400 kilometers from Belgrade down to Pristina by herself, avoiding missiles and ro NATO missiles and roadblocks. And she did this so that she could accurately uh, portray through the BBC, Radio Free Europe, and other media um, exactly what was going on. 
She has received many, many, many awards. This is a lioness uh, in the field of international humanitarian law. Um, so in conclusion, obviously I have a lot to say, but I'll, I'll wind up. I would like to conclude with words uh, of Natasha Kondich. In 2000, she wrote the following words to a general in the Yugoslav army. I stand where I have always stood, defending the right to life, the right to freely use one native's language, the right to freedom of movement, the right to publicly criticize authorities. I stand in support of every court that punishes the perpetrators of war crimes and those who ordered crimes against humanity. Ethnicity is irrelevant. A crime is a crime. And the values that she writes about are values demonstrated by the efforts of Eleanor Roosevelt, values challenged by the killings of Hajeri Shahidi and Sabahate Tolai, and values to which we can rededicate ourselves today in whatever way we are able to following Natasha Kondich's example. That is why the prosecutors will sign the third Chautauqua Declaration this weekend and why we can redouble our efforts towards seeking justice for women in international criminal law. Therefore, in my comments today, I am reflecting on women who have been the crime victim, the bystander, the perpetrator, the police investigator, the prosecutor, the defense attorney, the judge, the translator, the professor, and the human rights champion. They and we are bound together toward this goal, and I firmly believe that together we will succeed. These are my reflections on women in international criminal law. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Judge. Uh, we'll get started in just uh, a few uh, few minutes with the, the next panel discussion uh, uh, with the um, uh, trial attorneys, uh, Christine Chung, Leslie Taylor, and Manifa, if they can make their way down.